Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast, Gavin Shaw, Alex Wolf, and today you, you can hear it in my voice, Alex. It's a different level of excitement. This guy comes on. Benji Ridholtz joins us to drop some knowledge. Yeah, and we're talking about lots of different stuff in the first six games of the year. We're talking about Tibbs and how he's improved this year. Julius Randle, the things he's doing well. Talk about the fatal flaws of this team so far, namely the shooting and the defense. Talk about R.J. Barrett quite a bit and what we expect to see out of him. And a bunch more on this episode of Locked on Knicks. You are Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online. It's where the game starts, and we wanted to thank you for making Locked on Knicks your first listen today, and every day we are now available on all platforms. That includes on YouTube. You're going to want to check this out on YouTube to see me, Alex, and our great guest, Benji Ritholtz, but who are we really beyond our names? I'm Gavin Shaw, a play-by-play broadcaster. He's Alex Wolf, editor-in-chief of the Strickland, the greatest Knicks website out there. You can check them out on all forms of social media at the strict.land. That's right. We're not identified by our names. We're identified by our jobs. And uh, yeah, without further ado, on that optimistic note, uh, Benji Ritholtz, he's, he's a lawyer by day, but by night, uh, one of the best Knicks analysts in the whole wide world. Uh, does it for the Strickland, does it for Knicks Film School. And uh, this is, as always, a great conversation with him. So let's get into it right now. All right, guys, as promised, we are lucky enough to be joined by the venerable Benji Ridholtz, uh, one of our one of our all-time guests here on Lockdown. It's one of our all-time favorite guys to talk to. I'll bring it up every time you come on, Benji. I, th- I think I think we were, we were your first podcast appearance ever. So very true. I remember I remember you texting me after and being like, is, is there anything I could do better? I was like, um, you know, you said um, but I I always say um. Other than that, it was pretty perfect, and and I think I was I was forecasting one one of the great Knicks media careers to come. In yeah, career, right. So. I'm still saying um just as much as I did the first Good. time. So, yeah, uh, and, no and improvements every, and every, there. And every everything else is pristine, and you're still you're still spitting great <laughs> knowledge on top of it. Uh, and and you can find Benji doing that both uh, for Alex at the Strickland, and of course uh, with Knicks Film School on their podcasts. Uh, with, with with plenty of film threads uh, week in and week out. And it's all, as always, fantastic. So, Benji, uh, after, that, after that glowing intro for you, um, we'll, we'll keep we'll keep the optimistic note running because as, as you know it's been kind of a kind of a dour week uh, in the NBA mm. for a number of reasons that we don't have to get into. So let's let, let's start off with some positivity because I I, I just from reading reading your Twitter I, I know that that's something you try to emphasize even coming out of losses. So what do you, what have you liked uh, from Tom Thibodeau? And and I guess on a, on a grander scale, just the the strategic structure of the New York Knicks and, and and the process of the New York Knicks this year. Yeah. I've liked a lot of things. Uh, I've liked a lot of things. I like, I think the offense, um, I think he has added wrinkles and added some variety to what was generally a very predictable offense last season. Um, I think the reaction to some of the early games was that like the Knicks are now running offense when last year they ran all isolation. I don't think that's fair. I think they had, they had good stuff last year too, kind of in the playbook. It's just hard to run good stuff when you don't really have a point guard a and B when not everybody buys in. Um, And so that kind of leads me into my second point as well, which is, I think they've added wrinkles. I think there's a lot of good stuff in the playbook, and I think they have a point guard that can run it effectively, and I think that they have players now buying in. And the player that I'm really speaking about is Julius Randle, who, flaws aside, which still are there, doesn't seem to be able to shoot. Big problem. But putting that aside for a second, definitely a much better approach this season from the first possession. Getting to the rim, making quicker decisions, playing hard on defense, like all the stuff, getting down the floor with pace, all the stuff that drove us absolutely insane game after game last season um, has improved. So I give Tips some credit for that. I think he's he's bought, he's got him to buy in. I think having Brunson on the team helps to take a little bit of pressure, a little bit of spotlight off of Julius. Um, those are the things I am I am really feeling positively about coming out of the first six games. Yeah, we just talked about on a pod we recorded earlier today about Randall and how pretty much all the numbers are very encouraging right now outside of literally just like the three-point shot. 
And it's it's sort of similar in some ways to RJ Barrett, where it's like if just the three point shot starts falling for those two guys, I actually think that this team could be I don't want to say quite good, but regular good. You know, like they're right now, I think, you know, we've seen through the first six games, they're sitting at three and three and they've played some good teams. They've played some bad teams. They've played some mediocre teams. Like, you know, like I I don't think anyone is going to say that like Orlando, no matter what their record is, is like bad, bad. Like they're a team full of a ton of talent and the -hmm. the Knicks like pretty easily handled them in a game. But then, you know, they've, they've kind of gotten their butts handed to them by, um, you know, some of the, the higher up teams in the league, the last couple games. So, I, I don't know. I'm kind of curious where you're at with like, do you think it's really that simple that if, if RJ and Julius start hitting threes, that this team maybe takes on a whole new identity or, or slots himself into a whole new place on the, the league pyramid as far as being like legitimately good enough to make the playoffs? Because to me right now, it seems like, I mean, their offense is humming, you know, and their, their transition game is really potent. And their defense for all of its flaws with the perimeter defense and making Mitch do a little too much work on the inside. There's been good enough, you know, generally that like their offense is more than making up for it by scoring. Like, I don't know what their exact number is now, but guesstimating like one fifteen a game, something like that so far this year. Um, do you think it's, do you think it's as simple as just once those three start falling, that things could fall into place or are there other, uh, other things that you think that the Knicks maybe have to work on before they could be ready to take a step towards like potential playoff contention. Yeah, I I think well with Julius it's it's less about like once they start falling and I think it's more of an if they start falling. Um, RJ I think has given us a body of work now where he's gonna at least I think he's gonna shoot thirty six thirty seven percent at worst. I, you know, it could get even better than that. I think he's gonna be fine. Um, Julius, again, like we have one outlier, one outlier year and the rest of it is kind of the body of work. Um, so I have my doubts and I, I, I think if he really can't shoot, um, then I, I don't, there's a very low, there's a fairly low offensive ceiling that that unit can really reach if Mitch is who he is constantly in the paint. And then Randall needs to be in the paint and can't really stretch out. Um, Brunson and RJ are good shooters, but they're not stretchy players. Like their 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 goal is to get into the lane as well. So I just think it's a bit clunky, and the fit is not is not anywhere near perfect in terms of offensive efficiency. Uh, and so I I don't think the offense is going to get to that kind of place where like. Because I, I do think they can be a top 10 defense. Um, I don't think they can be a top 10 offense if Julius really can't shoot. That's what I would say. And so I think if, if we're talking about, let's say, the 8th, 10th best defense in the league, and they're going to be somewhere around 15, 16, 17 offense in the league, um, I, I don't think that – that's probably not getting you an automatic play, playoff spot. I think it gets you into the play-in, but I don't – I don't that, and that's kind of where I see this team. That's where I've seen them since the, the year began. Um so maybe that's a bit pessimistic, but that's that's where I'm at. All right, we are going to move on to talking about R.J. Barrett um, and reasons to be optimistic, reasons to be pessimistic about him. Benji makes a compelling argument on both sides. Uh, first, if you want to be optimistic about your wallet and just, just about the fun you have on a daily basis, there's, there's one website to go to for money and fun. I can't think of a better combination. It's betterfine.net. They're your number one source for betting football and the start of the new basketball season. You can find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth analysis on every single game. And as always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every single sport out there. It's the fastest and easiest way to check out all your favorite games and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, golf, and the latest, I'm going to call these funky NBA odds. So the one we're talking about today is pretty commonplace. If you want to put some money down on MVP, they have odds for that. The name that I'm looking at on this list, it's painful, because, but we're going to talk about him later in the episode. So I thought it was relevant. Is Donovan Mitchell at 75 to 1 if you're going for, oh, excuse me. Oh, actually, so he was 75 to 1 in June. Now he's all the way down to 28 to 1. I still think worth some money because I, I think that Cleveland team could potentially shock everyone and become the number one seed in the Eastern Conference. And if they do, and Donovan Mitchell is the one leading the charge, and you know how the narrative works with MVP people like uh, new players to win it every single year. 
Uh, much to the chagrin of me and all Knicks fans, it could be him. So head to the website today. Use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online. It's where the game starts. And we want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today. For your second listen today, check out Locked On Sports today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports today, available on the app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. So I, I guess what you're I, kind of talking about without saying there to somewhat is, is the, or, or at least at least that comment was adjacent to this debate, the Obi Toppin, Julius Randle conversation. And I, I find it an interesting one with, to your point, Julius is doing everything we could have ever wanted from him. I mean, I, I just think he's playing the, the combination of effort and intelligence. The, the upgrade in those two areas is, is not something that I really consider within the realm a possibility to enter the season. And, and it's a joy to watch. And there, there are times where he's, he's the reason that they're, they're in games. He's the reason that they have a chance to win games. I mean, even, even you look at that Hornets game where on one hand, I was upset that OB sat the whole third quarter. On the other hand, I was like, I don't know if they would be in this game if Julius wasn't basically doing everything, every single possession offensively, whether it's scoring, whether it's drawing a double or triple team and then flinging a pass over his head back out to a shooter, um, whether it's it's even the hockey assists with him this year where he just gets a defense in rotation and that allows IQ to make the next play uh, that much easier. Um, and early in Obi's career, I never thought we'd be in a situation, especially considering his rookie year was, was Julius's outlier year where I'd be talking like, all right, well, we need Obi to provide spacing, but that's sort of what it's turned into. And I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is, are all the things that Julius does well ultimately – irrelevant if, if to your point he is who he is as a shooter and this is kind of an unfair question there's no way to know but do you think the front office ever recognizes that fact and, and says all right we have a golden opportunity to sell high on this guy that as long as Mitchell Robinson is our center RJ Barrett is our, our small forward um though and, and Jalen Brunson is our point guard uh he's he's probably never going to make long-term sense on this team I don't want to say irrelevant I, I think he's been really good this season. Like I, I think even with the efficiency not being where we'd want it to be, I think he's made a lot of, he made a positive impact on the team. Um, so definitely not irrelevant. And I think he deserves credit and praise for kind of turning around so far in terms of his process, in terms of his attitude. Um, but I agree with you. And I, I do think the front office recognizes it because I, I, I think they tried, I think they, if they found a deal that they liked, I think he wouldn't be on the team. Like, I don't think they're like committed to Julius Randall in any long-term sense, the way they're committed to Jalen Brunson. That might be the end of the list in terms of who they're committed to long-term, but, <laughs> but, but Jalen Brunson, I think is one player they're committed to long-term. Um, and I, I think I, I don't know. And it seems to me based on the decision-making, because unless the coach really goes rogue, I think, Decisions are made together. It seems to me that the front office is not convinced that Obi Toppin is a starting power forward in the league, because if they were convinced of it, uh, I think he would play more. Um, I saw a stat earlier today. I don't remember who I saw it from, and I hope it was accurate that when we're talking about like minutes per game for a top 10 pick in the last like 10 years, Obi is like literally in bottom 10 in that list. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. Um, and it is circumstantial and that Julius Randall year was like a weird miracle that may have been the worst possible thing to happen in some sense in terms of the long term for this team. But I don't think the front office is committed to Obi Toppin. I don't think they think he, for whatever reason, and we could talk about those reasons that they might feel this way. I don't think that they see him as the long term answer at that position. Yeah, it is kind of bizarre, isn't it, that there wouldn't be more of an effort to get him time considering this he was like the first marquee draft pick of this regime too is represented by the the son of the president of basketball operations like at his former agency and everything else it just it, it is kind of bizarre how things have gone with obi to this point uh likewise something that's been a little bizarre and we touched on him a second ago but i wanted to circle back on him RJ Barrett, I think his early season has been a bit bizarre here. You know, it's we saw him come into the preseason and shoot 50% and not on a small amount of threes per game. He was shooting like six per game in the preseason. 
now comes into the regular season is shooting in many cases more volume than that in a lot of games but hitting substantially less and i am not able to to nail down why other than just thinking to myself like he must just be in his own head but i i know that you uh, you know, at least in, in our sphere of influence, famously have been sort of on top of uh, RJ's shooting mechanics and, <laughs> and, you know, keeping an eye on what he's doing. Yeah. And you you had noticed in the preseason, I remember you put out like a side by side video of this, of that his motion had gotten a little more compact and he was getting the shot off faster, which was allowing him to hit those, you know, those shots with with a smaller window but also, you know, keep the same amount of accuracy and not have to adjust his, you know, release in some meaningful way to screw up his routine. And I, I saw that too. Once you kind of opened my eyes to it, I started seeing that during the preseason, during this regular season so far, like functionally, it looks like until it like leaves his hand, it looks like everything is still mostly going the same way as far as this process. And then once it leaves his hand, it's just uh, as Clyde might say, it's a UFO a lot of the time. And you're just like, <laughs> where is this coming from i'm curious if you've seen anything during this regular season so far that is kind of one way or the other either concerned you like oh that looks a little different from during preseason or whatever or has been encouraging to you where you're just kind of like the same conclusion i just came to which is like i don't know the process looks good so let's just hope the results come eventually yeah the, me the mechanics look fine to me and and i, I think they've stayed fairly consistent I think when he's on the move, I think defenders have gotten even more aggressive going under his pistol action to force him to shoot that three. And I don't think he looks comfortable setting his feet off the dribble and shooting. And that's been true his whole career. I thought he found a little bit of a rhythm in that sense last season during the last portion of the year. I, I, maybe he changes mechanics now. So that's kind of taking an adjustment again. I, I, I would, it's a bit beyond me to be honest. I'm, I haven't, slow mode and broken down every single shot attempt this season. But to me, it looks fine. I have, you know, kind of look closely at a couple of his attempts just to kind of check myself. And I, it looks new, looks good. Um, I, there's shot variants. Like, I, I don't know if we, if, if it needs to go much beyond that. Like, I think he will find it. Um, I think his rhythm generally is a bit strange. I think he's adjusting to a new role. I think he's, his usage is down. Um, and that makes sense with Jalen Brunson on the team. I think it probably should be a little bit down. Um, but I, I don't have much more commentary than that. Like I maybe a little out of the rhythm or a little out of rhythm, maybe taking a couple tough ones that he's not yet comfortable with, but like otherwise in terms of his catch and shoot game, like I just think it's going to come. What do you, I don't even know if concern is the right word because maybe you just don't think it'll ever be a thing, but how, how do you feel about his mid range game? Because I know you highlighted a clip recently from the bucks game where Bobby Portis, I think on three different occasions went under a screen on RJ all, all in one possession, not, not in a quarter, not in a half, not in a game, all, all in one possession. Um, and, and when, when he's playing with Mitch, that just, I mean, that, that kill that murders a possession, right? Like there, there's, there's nothing else to say about it. Like there's not, it's, it's you kind of got to just lob a grenade to Jalen Brunson and say, all right, go figure something out with five seconds left on a shot clock and against the better defenses in the NBA, that's not going to work. So do you see ways for him to find solutions there? I mean, I remember his second year is a big thing that he was always snaking, picking rolls and finding a way to, I, I think it was usually like a left elbow where he would get like a pretty decent shot off. And, and it's come in, in fits and spurts where there, there, there are small stretches where it looks good, but to your point, the, the same issues with setting his feet from three seem to be like, I, I guess, generally in an even more stressful situation, like all the more difficult for him in the mid range. Yeah. Yeah. I, he's bad at it. I don't, I don't, <laughs> he's just not, he doesn't, the more he's moving pre shot, the less touch he seems to have. Mm -hmm. um, and so even like, if he catches on a pistol action, they come set the screen, the guy goes under, he stops after one dribble and pulls. That looks a little bit better to me than when he a couple dribbles in is trying to pull up on the move, leaning one way. Like it just doesn't come together for him. Uh, it just doesn't really have that kind of body control and touch combination that you need in those kind of in-between areas. Um, it is, it's damaging. I mean, it's a, it's a true limitation on his game. Um, 
And uh, like the optimist, I think would say more than I, th I think if you're being reasonably optimistic, you would say he can do be good despite that flaw. Cause I don't think that's turning into a strength. So whether it's taking that, getting better at that pull up three, so we're, and, and then being a bit more pass happy once you're in the lane, instead of taking a floater or a pull up or finding ways to burrow yourself into the rim anyway, which I think he does at times really well, even when he's given that space, use it as a runway, get a guy off balance and go finish, you know, those types of things. Um, it's going to be about kind of planning around it. I think more than it's going to be about getting better at it. So moving, moving to a different uh, discussion topic here. I think the biggest thing, especially recently that Gavin and I have been a bit disappointed in is the, the defense of the Knicks and the fact that that has been their calling card for so long. And I, I alluded to it a, a minute ago, like their offense is actually pretty good so far, but the, the biggest disappointment so far has been the defense. And it's mostly due to the fact that they just don't have anyone that's really doing a good job of preventing anything at the point of attack. Like, I think that we could safely say with Jalen Brunson, it's more than worth it for what he offers on the offensive end, but he is not good on defense. You know, he's, I, I would, I, I would say, I don't think this is too crazy to say that he's like at best slightly below average uh, on defense. I mean, I think that he tries very hard, but the physical limitations are just a lot for him. Uh, and then Evan Fournier is who he is at this point. If you want to talk about physical limitations, holding someone back. I mean, he's like, like exhibit a, like he tries very hard sometimes, but just can't keep guys in front of him. As Clyde points out all the time, he plays way too handsy on defense to try to make up for it. Yep. And it just leads to a bunch of stupid fouls and created opportunities for, you know, opponents at the free throw line and stuff. And then of course we have RJ who we've talked about a bunch and have come to the conclusion, like all in all this year, offense and defense has not been, what we were quite expecting uh, out of him. And so th that's your starting unit there that is supposed to defend the perimeter. Not a very strong unit. Then you look at the bench, Emmanuel quickly, I think has the right timing and the right abilities, but not necessarily the perfect size uh, to defend at multiple positions. You know, like we've seen that, that bite him once or twice, uh, despite the fact that he has the really good wingspan. So, but he could do a pretty good job on like point guards and, and most guards and Derek Rose, again, like another guy that kind of is who he is at this stage of his career. You'll take the, the, you know, nuclear level three point shooting that he's had right now. And the way that he can run an offense for his defensive limitations on the other end. Uh, and there's just kind of no answers outside of the guy that's hurt right now. And Quentin Grimes, do you think, in your professional opinion, is this Knicks team a Quentin Grimes away from kind of recapturing their defensive verve, I guess, if you want to call it that? Or do you think there's some issues that are running a little deeper right now? I have to say, like, I, you know, both from just the eye test and then you look at the numbers and all numbers are subject to swings and changes at this time of year so that there's very little value frankly in in many of these numbers but i will say like i i know the point of attack defense isn't very good um it wasn't really very good last year and it wasn't even that good two years ago although bullock i think was by far the best option um but like alfred payton was okay like I, they basically the scheme allows like okay we're gonna chase you over we're going to kind of pursue some guys do it better than others, but ultimately we're relying on Mitch to deter from the rim or protect the rim. And then we're going to scramble out. Um, I, I feel, I honestly feel like they've done that pretty well this year. I, I don't see that large a difference between certainly last year and this year. Um, but what's, if you look at the numbers and I, you watch the games, like they're getting crushed on the glass. I mean, they, their opponents are rebounding 31.8% of their misses right now which is third worst in the league. Um, and they don't force any turnovers. They never force. The Knicks never force turnovers. They haven't forced turnovers. They've been looking at cleaning the glass right now. They've been bottom 10 in forcing turnovers since 2015. 
They just don't force turnovers. They never have. And a tips team often doesn't because they'd rather stay sound and not gamble. But also the Knicks don't have a lot of guys that create turnovers other than Mitch when he blocks shots and Cam Reddish when he plays. Otherwise, they just don't. And quickly. I, I, IQ's, IQ's gotten some deflection. Yeah, quickly as well. Uh, certainly no one in the starting lineup. Brun- Brunson will, will draw a charge, but that's about it. Um, I, I th- the rebounding has been very weird. Um, they've just gotten crushed on the ground. And this is a team that was fourth best in terms of offending offensive rebounds last year. So that's the biggest swing to me. There's, th- their effective field goal percentage against is still excellent. It was excellent last year. It was excellent two years ago. It's excellent this year. But they are getting crushed on the boards and giving second opportunities, and it's hard to stop teams twice. And I, I, I really – the point of attack defense is an issue that I do think Grimes – solves to some extent um which is why grimes needs to come back and play and probably start but even without that they just need to commit better to rebounding the basketball um i do think part of that and 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 this is where grimes helps in this L aspect too is that because rj barrett is guarding the primary drivers or pick and roll players he's not under the rim rj barrett's their the most size that they have on the wing and when he's playing, when he's in his natural position in help or on the weak side, like he was two years ago when Reggie Bullock would guard the best guy, he's a pretty good rebounder and he can box guys out and use his body and his strength. When he's guarding the, the primary ball handler, who's under the rim? Evan Fournier, Jalen Brunson. So he, if Mitch goes to contest, which he often does, and he does really well, and there's a miss, who's there to try to clean it up? Brunson or Fournier? And I think you're seeing a lot of the, that issue is coming up over and over again. And sometimes Mitch overcommits where he needs to stay back a little bit and help out on the boards a little better instead of contesting everything. But mostly, I honestly think everybody's kind of doing their job to the, to, to the best of their abilities. And then you have this rebounding issue that I think is really killing them. Grimes being put on the primary ball handle, they're allowing RJ back to provide some size on the back end, I think will really help. Um, so I agree that Grimes is going to help. Uh, in both elements, but I actually think in the rebounding side, maybe a little less intuitive, but I think as important. Yeah. I think part of the issue at times is, and I, I just really noticed this in the Cleveland game is, and, and I don't, you, you could answer this better than I could Benji, like whether this is a point of attack issue or something else, but just how scrambled they are and how often and like easily they get into rotations at times. And, and to me, where we're optimistic about is like, I think a lot of times it's just a lack of communication. And there are these switches that are almost like half switches. And, and you saw with Obi over and over again, where he couldn't recover back on Kevin Love. And sometimes it was because he was hedging too far, but you also saw it even when the starters came back in, in the game is RJ Barrett and Julius Randall. They, they tried to switch an action. RJ got like halfway over to love. And it's, it, it's, it's hard for me to tell at times is that lack of effort or is that two guys just completely on a different page. But I, I think even in transition, and, and again, this could just be they need to play more games. Yet, but there was a possession where Jalen Brunson was guarding no one, and, and, and Dean Wade, uh, heralded marksman, uh, got, a, got a wide open three because of it. So have you have you noticed that as part of the problem? Do you kind of ascribe that just to early season, like everyone figuring each other out? Or, or do you think those are more effort-based issues? Yeah, great question. Two, two things that... I think are kind of more fundamental and what, and, but I, so like number one, Julius Randall, whether he switches or stays has been a three year mystery. I don't know. I, I have watched, I have tried to understand the scheme as to what the plan is when Julius Randall's in a pick and roll. And I cannot for the life of me, figure <laughs> it out. There are some games where like against Trey young, for example, like certain types of point guards where they'll just switch Julius every time. <laughs> Excuse me, but that's very rare. Very, very, it's very rare. And mostly it seems to be Julius Randle's decision whether he wants to drop or switch. Um, but they botch it so often that I'm just like, can we just make a rule? Like, can we just decide? Like, Julius is not that intuitive a defender where he should have so much say as to whether as to what the scheme should be on any given pick and roll in an NBA game. Like, let's just commit to something because it does seem that they botch it often and it often involves Randall, and it's very frustrating. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the Knicks, since Tibbs was the coach, have struggled with pip and pop, pick and pop bigs. They're not good at covering it. They don't want to switch, which is obviously the easiest way to cover a pick and pop. Tibbs is pretty much anti-switch. He likes to stay in scheme. If your scheme is a drop and you have a big that pops, it's hard to cover. It just is, which is why Vooch has hurt the Knicks a lot, which is why Miles Turner has hurt the Knicks a lot. Like in and I think Tibbs' general philosophy, and this was kind of the Bucks is and was the Bucks philosophy is. Find me the pick and pop big who's going to consistently hurt us enough from the top of the key that it's worth 
basically sacrificing other parts of our defense, including the rim. Mm. I don't think that's a, I, I don't think that's unfair. I think, especially in the regular season, over the course of a whole season, you're probably right that you're not going to meet many bigs who are going to pop and hurt you enough where it's worth really uprooting your scheme for those individual players. Kevin Love happens to be a great shooter, great shooter. And like, so is that an example? Like I said in the second quarter, I'm like, it was a, it was a Karis Levert, Kevin Love screen. I'm like, okay, it's Karis. It's not, it's not even Donovan Mitchell. The switch isn't even that dangerous. Like we can't let OB guard Karis Levert and make that. No, Tibbs doesn't want to do it. And then it ended up hurting them in the fourth quarter when Love is popping with Donovan Mitchell. And then when they do switch it, Julius gets burned on a step back by Mitchell, which is the fear, right? So like, there's no good answer. It's hard to cover. Tibbs doesn't generally like to switch it. He wants to concede that three or at least, you know, try to contest it, obviously, but he's willing to basically allow a contested pick and pop three. That's just his philosophy. And that is what it is. Those are two things. And then, but to your point, Gavin, in general, and I've seen it a lot with Brunson early and it, yeah, he's with new teammates and like, Everyone's trying to figure it out early season. I think there is kind of a margin uh, for error that you should allow in terms of like, okay, the defense is hard in the NBA. There are a lot of actions being run. There are going to be some miscommunications on switches. Um, some, especially with a guy like Brunson, who you don't, again, like another, another great thing about the Knicks defense two years ago was the switchability on the perimeter when you had Bullock, Peyton and RJ, just in terms of size, like you could just switch everything and not really worry about it. Well, now it's not so simple because there are matchups. You really don't want Fournier in there matchups. You definitely don't want Brunson in. Right. So like it's deciding when to switch, deciding when to stay. Like you're just seeing some general miscommunication that I think will kind of sort itself out. But those two issues, like the pick and pop big has been a consistent issue in the Tibbs era and um, the Julius, what the hell is he doing on defense issue? Um, those are, I think, need to be sorted out, figured out to kind of get this team to the defensive ceiling we think they can reach. So you brought up a name during that that whole discussion uh, or uh, that came up a lot during the summer for the Knicks, and that was Donovan Mitchell. We just got a first-hand look <laughs> at that destruction the other day, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the, the wounds are still pretty fresh. Mm. And uh, if memory serves, you were pretty in favor – <laughs> of going after him uh so i'm uh, I just kind of curious like how do you feel at this moment about the decision to not go for him like would you still have done things the way that the knicks did do you think they uh, like do you think that they've served their long-term vision well by not going after a guy like him or do you think that they should have ultimately gone after someone like him i know that we're we're talking very like nuts and bolts and this is like well beyond nuts and bolts this is just like a, a big like meta nicks yeah. question here but how, how are you feeling about that now one game into the mitchell versus the knicks as a cav era <laughs> yeah yeah i i don't want to like we, we don't have to real litigate like how much they should have given up and what was the what was the line because i, I think it's been it's been litigated a lot. And I also think that we don't really necessarily know what the, what offer would have gotten it done and what, what was the line for the Cavs, et cetera. Uh, but yes, generally I think it's safe to say that I was willing to give up more than the average Knicks fan or Knicks uh, analyst, uh, you know, if you will, or whatever, then, you know, I, I, I thought, I thought, um, I think he's very, very special. I think he's very, very special. Um and so I was kind of like, let's get him and figure everything out. Uh, I think he's that worth it. Uh, understanding that there was no second star ready to come, understanding you're giving up a lot of late draft capital, uh, you know, far in the far in the future. Yeah, I was like, let's do it. Um, I'm not going to like told you so because of one game in uh, October. But nonetheless, I think just in terms of understanding how special that guy is and can be, uh, I think it was um, certainly enlightening. Um, yeah, I, I have this funny dissonance right now watching this team, which is I um, I enjoy the team. Like, and when they signed Brunson and Hartenstein, I was like, those are two players that I really value and enjoy watching. Like, I think they're excellent basketball players. They are intelligent basketball players. They are unique basketball players. Like, they're fun players to watch and root for. And like, so the fan in me is like thrilled that I get to watch those guys every night. And even like the basketball 
purist, you know, like analyst in me, like loves watching those guys play. I think they, they teach you a lot when you watch them. That said, like in terms of when I take a step back and I think about like championship equity and I think about like, where is this team actually going and whether this approach made sense. So we didn't go for Mitchell, but we did sign Brunson. We did, we have a whole lot of money tied up in Brunson, Barrett, Randall. Um, the young guys are now, especially Sims, but even guys like quickly now, because Brunson's there are getting less time than they otherwise would have. Like once we didn't go for Mitchell, did it make sense to kind of just go young? And then like the extreme of that obviously is even like, if you can tank, right? Like these are all very fair questions that I think if you're just dismissing them because you like what rooting for a good team, I don't, I don't blame you for that. Like if fans can want different things and competitive basketball is, a, is valuable and fun. And like, if you're going to take your time out every night to watch this team, you might as well watch good ball. I'm, I think I'm more on that side of it anyway, but like, there is a dissonance. There is a dissonance. Like I, 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 I'm not sure I know the direction here. I don't, I'm not sure that there's, I'm not sure the Knicks have really done anything to improve championship equity this off season by signing really good veterans and not getting the star that was available or quote unquote available. And then not playing your young guys as much as they otherwise play I, that I struggle with. I do. Um, that's a kind of a long-winded way of, I guess, answering that I I am both happy and not so happy about where the Knicks are going, depending on what uh, perspective I'm, I'm looking at at the moment. Yeah, does that make I, sense? No, no, it does. Because I, I think I'm in the exact same place where I, I think it's, it's inarguable that the organizational health is in the best and most sustainable place it's been in two decades. And that's not, that's not a small thing. Maybe, maybe it's a low bar, but it's not a small thing because <laughs> no one else has been able to do it for the yeah. last... 20 years or so. And the fact that they have all their picks that they have a million extra picks that they have all these tantalizing young talents. And, and you can, as, as we are wont to do, pick apart the ceilings of all those guys, but you can just say you have a bunch of really good basketball players on this team. Um, and then on the other hand, like, I think this is exactly what you're getting at. There's, there's an uneasiness every time I watch this team is like, as someone who like, I mean, just like an analyst is invested in them. Someone who's like been a fan of this team for 20 years is invested in them um it's it's all right how do they how do they go up from this like ba basically where they've been the last three e even even last year when everything went wrong and it all it all sucked and it felt like the world was burning they, they won 37 games they were they were pretty their point differential was that of a 500 team and yet the grander vision to your point was getting someone like mitchell because then that that leaves room for for something more than that i mean whether you have to get really creative or, or you have to i mean whatever had to happen like there there are pathways there and I think the more we, I, I think the, the uneasiness that you're, you're describing and I'm feeling is the more you watch these young guys, at, at least I, I want to see something every night that makes me think, okay, they, one of them is going to eventually be Donovan Mitchell or, or collectively, they're all going to be just below that. And they're all going to be borderline all-stars. And, and maybe, maybe that's where we can wrap this conversation up, Benji, because I, I look to the guys who would have been in that trade and, and we've touched on RJ, we've touched on OB, you haven't really touched an IQ, but it, it's kind of been a similar story for him where, where they're, I mean, I, I would say same as Obi, where there are like clear improvements in some areas, but you don't necessarily see the, and, and Obi, it's unfair to say this about, because he just hasn't gotten the time, but you, you don't see the total package there. And then in my mind, my hope shift to Grimes, I'm like, all right, well, he's going to come back and maybe he'll be Desmond Bain-esque and, and score close to 20 points per game. But then if that doesn't happen, then where do we go? And on and on and on. And we had, we had Ian Begley on a few weeks ago and he made the point of, or not even the point, but he just said, he thinks the Knicks will trade for an all-star next off season. Like, all right, is, is the package any easier to construct when, when the primary flaw in doing last time's package was you didn't play these young guys enough and you didn't invest in them enough. So they weren't viewed as good enough assets. Like I, I don't right now, nothing's changing on that front. So that's a little bit worrisome. So that, that that's my long winded rant of saying like, do you feel like you have someone to bet on when I know you noted earlier in this podcast, Jalen Brunson is, is maybe the one sure thing to be here long-term or, or do you have hope that the collection of those guys that as this season goes on, one of them will go to that next level and you'll have that comfort. Either this will, even if he's not the number one guy, this, this will be a fixture on a Knicks team. That's something better than it is now, or, or he can be traded for the guy that'll do that. Um, are you asking me like who, who that player is? Like, who I, I, I know I'm, I'm asking I mean, if, 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 if you want to say that, but I'm asking, like, do you have hope that that guy is, is on, is on this team? I oh, guess. um, 
hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Big word. I, I don't think there's a Donovan Mitchell on this team. If, uh, no, yeah. I, I don't. Um, I, I, I do. I think there's an all star on this team um, from the young guys. Um If I had to bet, I would probably say no. Um, but that's not to say that RJ couldn't be an all-star. He could. And it's not to say that if Obi got 35 minutes a game, hell, on the pace he's at, he would probably average 30. Um, so maybe uh, – um, but I I don't know if I'll ever get that opportunity, and I, I don't know. Quickly, I think – with quickly, it's going to be like how good of a shooter is he? Because he's valuable. There's no question he's valuable. He's good on both ends. He's become a good playmaker. He's he's a, He can guard multiple positions. He He's smart. He's energetic. All the things that we love about Emmanuel quickly. If he wants to get to a level where he's like an all-star player, he's got him. He's got to be a really good shooter. Because he's never going to take a ton of layups. Right? Like So like he, he's got to become a really good shooter. And the evidence has been kind of mixed. Like he takes a lot of tough shots. So that brings down the percentage, but I'm not even talking about percentage. I'm just like talking about like, can this guy make enough shots to be a really good scorer in the NBA? Um, that's kind of this, like in terms of all-star, like it's very rare that you get non-scoring, like not big scoring all-stars. The only way is if you're like um, a Rudy Gobert yeah. or uh, or a Draymond Green, like the best defensive players in the league. But otherwise, like to be that kind of player, you got to score the basketball. And like, is, can Emmanuel quickly shoot well enough, even though he's going to have a difficult shot diet? Um, to get there again, like, is it po- absolutely possible? I, I, if you were asking me to bet one or the other, I would probably bet against. Um, yeah, and then Grimes, like, I, I, I think is more of a like the. I think he's going to be a really good role player. I don't see that kind of. Um, like I guess Clay Thompson was an All Star with like mostly a catch and shoot game, but again, unique situation, unique player. Um, not impossible. I would just think more of a of a really high end role player kind of ceiling for him. Um, yeah. So I guess <laughs> I guess I I, I would sorry to paint it. you into a position to be pessimistic. I didn't. Yeah, I, 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 and I, everyone. I mean, anybody who follows me knows I love these guys. I love a lot of the elements of these guys' games. I just like if you're you know just trying to be intellectually honest about it, despite mm-hmm. my fandom and how much I like these guys. Like I, um, I, I don't, I, I would, I don't think that they're going to reach that kind of uh, pedigree or or status, but wouldn't bet against it like i i think it's very possible if i may just remind you though <laughs> in regards to catch and shoot all-stars kyle corver did once make an all-star team oh so, yeah the four hawks I, right I just i just want to throw that out there yes the four hawks didn't make it the one time that was when the east was so bad and the hawks were so good they're just like all right there aren't enough good players De- anyway so <laughs> Demari Jeff Carroll, T- i mean jeff teague was one of them for god's yeah sake. damari carroll was probably about a hair away from being <laughs> yeah, yeah so. one, one one pink eye away from being <laughs> Yeah. But at any rate, Benji, thanks so much for popping on, man, and, and talking Knicks with us and taking the temperature of the team. We we had this like rare little couple day break and we were like, this is so perfect nice. opportunity I love, I love to the overreact. Couple day break. I love yeah. the couple day break. Yeah, perfect opportunity back. to overreact yeah. to a couple games, you know, <laughs> to six games so far <laughs> exactly. and get our takes out there. So we appreciate you coming on with us. Do you want to just remind everybody real quick before we get off uh, where they can find you online and, and all your work and uh, anything else you want to plug? Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, at Ben Ritholtz MBA uh, is my Twitter account. Um, I, I'm posting stuff all the time on there. Um, you can find me uh, in the Strickland Nick's Film School. Um, I'll get to writing again at some point. Um, but uh, otherwise, yeah, just follow me on Twitter. And, and uh, f- thanks, guys, for having me. This is always a lot of fun to jump on and catch up. So appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Benji. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back with a game recap. Uh, I won't be on it, but, but Alex uh, will have it for you against the Hawks. Uh, Knicks, Knicks are always great against the Hawks, as we know. So we'll see We'll see how that goes. But until next time, uh, we'll talk to you soon on Lockdown Knicks. All right. And that's all with Benji. Thanks so much again to Benji for popping on. And thank you for making Locked on Knicks your first listen today and every day for your second listen. 
Check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast with our buddy Peter Bukowski. The biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts.